Welcome into K State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Drew Galloway. We are here to get you ready for the Cats and the Cougars. Another Big 12 battle for K State on tap, second straight road game for K State. And now it, uh, it it becomes a really big one after losing in Ames on Wednesday night. It's not an easier test by any means. The team that K-State will face on the floor is better than the one that they faced in Ames. Probably not going to have to face as tough of a crowd as you had to in Hilton. But this is, this is going to be a, a fascinating game. I mean, on paper, obviously, uh, it doesn't look very good. K-State doesn't have many good wins this season. They don't have a ton of depth with their true talent on the roster. And Houston's the number four team in the country at home. Ken Palm projects them to win by 17 points on Saturday. But this is an early tip, 11 a.m. Maybe you get a little bit of a sleepy crowd. And the thing that I always say about Houston, I have seen them lose to much lesser American Athletic Conference teams at home. So it's not an impossible feat. I wouldn't write K-State off in this game. It is just going to be a pretty big uphill climb for the Wildcats, who if they don't win this game, they all of a sudden go from 4-1 and one in first place in the league to 4-3, and three, and they join that giant log jam of teams that will also end up being 4-3. and three. So, Drew, what is uh, the expectation going into this game for K-State, considering how they lost on Wednesday and the challenge that's in front of them with Houston? It's going to be a tough matchup. I mean, it, you look... And on paper, Houston does a lot of things well. They do a little bit of everything, which makes them tough and a tough out, and especially at home. This is one where you probably hope that the game is close by the end and you just kind of see what happens because of how good Houston has been. Like, it's not impossible for K-State to win. Like you said, like, Temple was awful last year, and it went into Houston and won. But the matchup isn't really conducive to K-State. Houston doesn't turn the ball over. Houston turns teams over uh, at a high clip. And those are two things where, like, K-State usually turns team teams over, but also turns the ball over themselves. But I, I will say, matchup-wise, in terms of players and size and everything, this isn't the worst matchup for K-State. And I'd honestly say that Iowa State, physically was probably a different or was probably a harder matchup for K-State. Like we, we saw last year when LJ Cryer played against K-State in both games, he was pretty bad. So we'll, we'll kind of see how that goes. Uh, Jamal Shedd is, I, I imagine we'll get into that later on, but Jamal Shedd is one of the best players in the league right now. And stopping him will be vital for K-State. Yeah. And look, you, you bring up LJ Cryer. He's fascinating right now because he got off to a really fast start in Big 12 play. He scored 20 against West Virginia, and then he had three straight games where he was under double digits in scoring. But since then, he's picked it back up. He's been really good over the last couple of games for Houston, and it's coincided with this three-game win streak that they've gone on since they dropped two games early on in conference play on the road to Iowa State and TCU. Uh, but – you know, this is a team in Houston that you mentioned Shed, obviously really talented in what he does. And I think that they have they have gotten themselves in a position where they are they are comfortable now. Like I I worry about what 18 games does long term to yeah. these teams, but with them being at home, there there is a little bit more of a comfort there, and it's not as crazy of a routine yet. And I mean, they're in the middle of what could be considered one of their easier stretches of the season just because it's Tech, UCF, BYU, K-State. And look, those teams, Tech and BYU having really good seasons right now, but we, we're we kind of starting to see some warts in those teams. And Tech, uh, obviously, they're 4-1 and one still, but I, I think I, I, we can admit I, that that's you know, maybe not who they actually are. I would even say, too, like it, it's one of your easier stretches because there aren't many times – where you're going to have three out of four games at home in the league. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah. You're, you're getting the benefit of that. I would also, you know, you talk about Houston, like you go and look they're they're really good at a lot of things right now. And that's the thing with the last, really the first six opponents that K-State has had, you can find flaws in a lot of things that they do, but it's tough to do that with Houston. I mean, there's a reason why, 
they are a top five team and a reason why, I mean, Ken Palm has them as the, the top team uh, in, in their rankings. So yes. this team is, is really special. And we know LJ Cryer and, and how he played at Baylor and, and kind of his development there. This game comes down to, I mean, I've said a lot this year. This it, this game's about what K State will do, not what the opponent will do. They're getting into facing opponents where it's a combination now of yeah, you got to step it up, but you're also going to have to kind of bank that your opponent struggles in some areas. And Houston feels like they might be in the middle of of going on this run, so it's going to be a tough ask for K State. We saw on Wednesday night, Arthur Kaluma, he kind of stepped up again. I think he finished the game with 16 points for K-State. He led the way, hit some more big threes in there. He was three of eight from three. Um, so percentage-wise, a little bit lower than what uh, he had been over some of the last few games. But I'll live with that. Three of eight is fine, and I like Arthur Kaluma taking more of them because that's been some of K-State's best offense this year, especially in Big 12 play. Cam Carter, when he was in the game, he was actually pretty good for K-State. I, I mean, I, I'd have to go back and look exactly at what uh, the the final tallies end up being for Carter in that game because we had talked so much about uh, some issues. Um, but, you know, he scored for him. He made some key buckets. I The one thing that is a major problem, obviously foul trouble in that game, but he still turned the ball over a lot and he played less yeah. minutes than he had been. He finished with four turnovers and he had been, he played, uh, I mean, He's basically been playing like 36 minutes a game, maybe more than that. So in 15 minutes less of game time, he still had the same amount of turnovers. That is a problem. Um, now, two of those were offensive fouls, so it's not like it's as yeah. egregious as some of the ones against Oklahoma State where it just seemed like he got to uh, dribbling too fast and gave the ball away on a live ball turnover. But you got to keep him in the game, and – Tyler Perry's got to step up at some point here. Look, he he's had some moments. He's had some flashes. Hit two threes in that second half that felt pretty big against Iowa State. You need more than that out of him. That can't be the only thing that he gives you in a game. He's too talented to be just a guy that, hey, a couple key shots here and there, and he needs to step it up. Like, if Ish Masood was doing what Tyler Perry was doing, I, I mean, I think we saw this from Ish last year. He came in, he hit some, some big shots and big moments, and you look down. Oh, he only made two shots this game, or he only made one. You can live with Ish Masood doing that. Tyler Perry is supposed to be one of your best players. And at some point, I mean, K-State has been trying to sneak along here where you either get Tyler Perry to bust out. It's happened twice, but again, they were short spans. It wasn't for the duration of a game. And the other games, it's just kind of been like, you know, he's gotten the free throw line and, and you've survived him missing a lot of shots. This can't just be on Cam Carter and Arthur Kaluma anymore. Uh, this no. is uh, this is the point. I mean, it's almost February. Uh, there, there's only two more games until we hit February for K State. If Tyler Perry doesn't get it figured out in the next next week, he's probably a lost cause, and I, I'd give up hope if I'm K State or K State fans that he's going to be anything more than hey, occasionally he's going to knock down a three. Because I'll tell you this much: I'm tired about hearing how many other good things Tyler Perry is doing. You brought Tyler Perry to K State to be a scorer and to knock down his threes. He's not doing that right now, and he doesn't provide the value that you need out of him to win games in the Big 12. The Tyler Perry you thought you were getting was going to help you win Big 12 games. This Tyler Perry is not doing it. So this is a crucial game for him to go out there and try and get it figured out. Now, it it's a tough matchup for him to go out there and try and get it figured out in because, like we talk about knocking down threes, Houston, similar to K-State, has been really good at defending the three-point line throughout conference play. So this is going to be uh, this is going to be a big game, and he's probably the guy for K State that I'm keying in the most on on seeing what kind of game he has because I really am starting to just kind of give up any thought that Tyler Perry is going to step up for K State this season. The hard part with Perry too is that he hit those two big ones in Ames, but then there were a few times where he was wide open, and it was a point where K-State had to have a bucket and he couldn't knock it down. And those those are the ones that stick with you, I think, more than the makes. Is when he is wide open, it feels like he's shooting worse than when he takes a tougher three, which, like, that, that's something that we'd have to really track. I, I really it, think it comes down to, like, his brain processing it. I, I think he's, he's taking too much time to think through everything. Like, less thinking, yeah. more shooting. Because... Uh, 
that like I think a lot of people would look at it and go, I don't know. I think I'd want him to think about some of the shots he's taking. I think if you look at, at the shots he is taking, even if they seem like bad shots, I think he's thinking through it and he's overthinking some of this. Like I he's just in he's 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 in a tough spot. This is a a slumping of a year uh for Tyler Perry, and you gotta hope that you know he kind of comes out better for it within this season. The concern though is is that sometimes these guys have these things happen and it's just a one season blip, but it doesn't get better over the course of the season. Like I, I would compare it to obviously, you know, I'm a Cowboys fan. I watch the Cowboys a lot. I would compare it to Dak Prescott last year. Like early yeah. in his career, Dak had a fumble problem. That is fine. That that is that is well, we know this. Dak had never thrown interceptions at the rate that he did last season. And you start to think, man, is this what this guy is? He comes out this year. The interceptions are not a problem for Dak Prescott. I know what D.Y. and others might say about his playoff performance, but, you know, 17-game regular season, they weren't a problem. He got it figured out, but it was a totally different season. He got the full offseason to reset, and it's just new year, new mindset. And so you worry, like, is this the type of thing that Tyler Perry can snap out of, or is it the fact that we're looking down and K-State's played 19 games and you just have to say, this is who he is this year. He's not going to get better at it. Uh, and and it's unfortunate for him and K-State, it, it's it's struck in this moment. I'll also say, like like you said, like this is a game where he needs to play well and shoot well, and I wrote about it in the pick and preview, where in a game where you're probably out-talented, mm -hmm. the three-point shot is the great equalizer. And if so, it, it just takes one person getting hot, and K-State could stick around and maybe even win. And this is a Houston team that is really good defending the three, just like K-State. But kind of just like with K-State, three-point defense is so hard to judge about, like, what makes you a good three-point defense because so, so much of it is kind of luck on if the ball goes in. I will say, though, that uh, the two games Houston has lost this season were two completely different games. The Iowa State loss to Houston, or by Houston, was kind of an ugly game where the offense couldn't really get going for either team. I think Iowa State shot like 20% from three. TCU, when they beat Houston, shot 53% from three. So if you can shoot well, Houston's one kind of wart is that they play at such a low pace that if their offense isn't clicking on all cylinders and they shoot like 35 or 40 percent even they're going to struggle to score the ball like the, the game against ucf where they held ucf to 42 points they could still only score four, or 57 because they couldn't get anything going on offense either ucf hit seven total shots in the game and only lost by 15 because houston couldn't really get anything going on offense either so that's kind of the one weakness where if you play good enough defense and you make shots, you'll at least be able to hang around. Yeah. And I mean, that, this is one of those things where you go and look at what maybe Houston has, has struggled with and what K state has been uh, good about on their end. Offensively, the one area where Houston has struggled is, you know, the threes are going in for them right now. They hit about eight a game. Uh, but they have struggled from two in Big 12 play. And so that's one area where K-State has actually been good during Big 12 play. I know that you hear us talk about bad shots all the time. That's because they still take too many of the bad twos. But K-State's been better about it. And we saw that at points in the Iowa State game. They did eventually get some looks inside that made it easy for Will McNair to score. And we've seen that at other points. On the flip side, just the same problem that K-State had to start the game against Iowa State on Wednesday with turnovers, something that's plagued K-State all year. Houston is one of the best teams in the country at forcing turnovers. And that hasn't, I mean, it slowed down a little bit in Big 12 play, but they were they're so good at it that their version of slowing down is, I think, 20% of possessions in Big 12 play, they're forcing a turnover. It was 26% overall. So this is something that K-State, like this is another thing that is on them protecting the basketball and like the, I just talked about Tyler Perry, you know, he might be what he is at this point. Like we're getting to that stage for Cam Carter. Like I think it's three straight games with at least four turnovers for Cam Carter. It's been a problem. It's put them in major holes. Uh, 
he's going to have to be better about that and how he handles this and what kind of pressure Houston throws out there. Cause I, I think I, I expect them to be a pretty physical opponent for K state again, and to put K state in some of the same uncomfortable situations that they had in Ames where, you know, if you're not getting certain calls or calls are coming against you, um, are you going to be able to keep yourself in the game mentally? And are you going to be able to process and figure out the best way to attack it and get past whatever it is that your opponent is doing to, to make life tough on you? K-State eventually started to do it against Iowa State, but you could argue it took too long. And that's why instead of coming out of there with a win, you did battle back and get a tie, but you never got any closer than that. Kind of similar to TCU uh, when they played Iowa State. TCU went out, lots of turnovers early. They built too big of a hole, and they ended up losing by one. So I think that's uh, another thing to keep in mind for K-State. Yeah, and, and like I said, like uh, Houston's also a team that just doesn't turn the ball over themselves. They only average eight turnovers a game, which is crazy to think about because <laughs> there's been points where K-State's had eight in like a 10-minute stretch, it felt yeah. like, this season. Uh, the other big key, I think, is rebounding. Houston's a very, very good rebounding team. K State has been pretty bad on the defensive glass uh, so far in Big 12 play. And Houston is very good on, on the offensive glass. And, and I put it as one of the keys, again, in the pick and preview of team rebounding needs to be a big thing. All five guys have to be able to get rebounds. You can't have a game like Wednesday night where your three biggest players on the floor in the starting five, David Gasson, Will McNair, Arthur Kluma, combined for five total rebounds, and only two of those yeah. were defensive rebounds. That that just can't happen if yeah, you want to keep it close. That's it's it, it's a great point because it was the rebounding was atrocious on uh on Wednesday night. And at one point you look, I mean, it was pretty late in the first half. They only had six rebounds, and three of them belonged to Dorian Finister. It's just inexcusable. Uh, for how things were were going down, and like Iowa State size wise throws guys out there that match K State's profile a little bit better, but they're still kind of different players. It's not necessarily like they profile the you know, this is just some massive team with you know bigs left and right that can like K State should have been able to compete better down there, and they didn't. Uh, I, I think it'll be interesting to see how this team handles the big situation and pivots in the near future. Uh, maybe this this game provides an opportunity. I mean, uh, Will McNair struggled early in the game, and I, I, it was worth trying Jarrell Colbert. He also struggled. But I think that there needs to be a willingness that when Will McNair is clearly weighing you down on defense and can't hang for what you need to do, you got to be able to adjust a little bit quicker and better if you're K-State. Now, in the end, it didn't really matter because both players were terrible in the first half uh, for K-State against Iowa State. So we'll see how that ends up working out uh, but, against Houston. <laughs> I will say that this game could be a game where you could probably survive with four guards or three guards, Kaluma and Gasson, because Houston's not like a massive team by yeah. any stretch of the imagination. This I mean, they're they're Emmanuel Sharp plays the three most of the time for him. He he's six foot three, so you're not you're not going to overwhelm yourself if you throw another guard out there. It's just a matter of you know I, I thought Data Aim showed some better flashes offensively. He finished at the the rim a couple times, um, so maybe maybe that's something you can live with and, and go from there. Because I I do think it would be nice to be able to see this roster out there with three guards and then uh, Kaluma and Gasson as the the four and the five. And maybe I mean I, I, honestly I don't care who you rotate in at this point, but you know how I feel f philosophically about basketball. Um, if, if they can't shoot it, I, I don't need to see that many big guys on the floor together. So it's a little tough for me when I, I Will McNair, David Gasson, and the Kaluma are out there together. Uh, so I, I would I would be down for however you want to do it. Day-Day, RJ Jones, Finister if you have to, um, just whatever you end up doing. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, what else do we need to know about Houston before we move on to our MVPs and predictions for the game? Uh, I guess the one thing, and you kind of touched on it a little bit, it, it, is it coincidence or is it not that probably two of LJ Cryer's worst games, and especially his worst games from the field, that Houston lost? Now, they've only lost two games, but he also only had 10 points and was 
four of 23 from the field in those games. So it's a good point. Do you think that that's a coincidence? Especially on a team, like I said, like Houston isn't, they're more efficient on offense than like an overwhelming team of like, they have a bunch of dudes yeah. that can score when they aren't efficient from the field. And th- this was, has been their problem. Even when they were in the American, when they aren't efficient from the field, they let teams hang around and beat them because they, a lot of times they don't have enough firepower on offense this season. They have a little bit more firepower with Cryer, but in those two games. And the other thing I'll also say it, do you think that it's a coincidence that they've played four old big 12 schools and LJ Cryer has struggled against three. Do you, do you think that that's a coincidence? Uh, maybe somewhat, but also it does make sense that it would be a little bit tougher on him. And you go and look last year, Cryer, he had, I mean, the game in Waco, he was not good. He was a non-factor for Baylor, uh, in terms of what he did. I mean, he He was even worse in Manhattan. He had four points, uh, in that game and only got off five shots. Uh, so, so not a great showing, uh, for him there, uh, in Manhattan, he, the final numbers end up looking better. Uh, he was he had 16 points, was four of seven from three, six assists. But if I remember right, it feels like some of those came at the end. Some of those shots, uh, when I think you know the game had pretty much been decided at that point. So he he may be some empty shots there. But also, you just have the familiarity aspect of it. Like Jerome Tang has a good idea of what L.J. Cryer is as a basketball player, and like you're saying. I, I do think he's the key to what Houston does uh, because he is offensively the, their most talented guy. He has the highest offensive ceiling. I mean, they have a couple guys shooting pretty well from three on the team, but he's the only one that's within, you know, like five points basically of shooting 40%. So yeah. that's that's the thing that I would be wary of is, is LJ Cryer. Yeah, and like Emmanuel Sharp, uh, their second leading scorer, not a great shooter. He's a pretty yeah. decent shooter, but he's only 38% from the field as a guard. So he doesn't really scare you. Shed is pretty solid shooting wise, but he's been more of kind of, of a distributor during the yeah. 12 play. So it, it makes it really could come down to how good is LJ Cryer tomorrow morning? Because he seems to be like the catalyst of when Houston has big games, especially on offense. Yeah. All right. MVPs, predictions. My MVP for this game, if K-State's going to get it done down there, you're going to need Cam Carter in a big way. Number one, keep yourself in the game if you're Cam Carter. Number two, cut the turnovers down. And then your defense is going to be much needed in this game, especially like you're talking about Houston's efficient, you know, lower possession game. Each one means a little bit more, so you need him to step up. And I would just also say, like, the volume at which he could pour it in, I'm just more likely to assume that he, that he can give it to you than Tyler Perry right now. So give me Cam Carter. Now, in terms of score prediction, I don't think K-State gets beat by 17. That seems pretty lofty. And from what we've seen from K-State this year, um, I know that the metrics don't like what they're going to put out there, but – their defense is really good and they've played close games against everybody really except for Nebraska when they got absolutely nothing from their offense. Um, Cause their defense was still pretty solid in that game. They just gave up a ton of offensive boards. Uh, I think Houston probably comes out on top in this game. It's probably in the neighborhood of like 68 to, uh, I don't know, 57, something like that. I guess that's the final score. Uh, the, or uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. I, it's pretty similar uh, in my head to to what K State and Iowa State did. I guess that was uh set was that seventy eight sixty seven that it ended up being yeah. it was the eight and the seven. But I think that's probably the neighborhood we're in. Houston gets probably a ten to you know thirteen point win. That K State has a little moment there where in the second half they might cut the lead down to like five, and you start to go here we go. But then Houston just is too good, has too much talent. K State can't overcome it and. We're talking about a four and three K State team in league play, fourteen and six overall. When they get back to Manhattan on Tuesday, that they absolutely have to beat Oklahoma uh, in Bramlage Coliseum next week. Uh, ne- I mean, next week is just littered with gotta have it situations for K State. So we'll see uh, 
how it ends up working out for the cats. Yeah. Uh, my MVP, I'll say, I'll, I'll also go with the garden. I, I'll stick with Tyler Perry. I, I just think okay. that, I think that one game he's going to have another breakout game. Um, I think that they, like you said, with Carter, they, they just, they also need Perry because he needs to be able to knock down shots as well. And he's going to be relied on defensively too. And that, it's going to be a tough game. I, I also thought about David Gasson just for the simple thought of Houston can struggle on offense at times. Getting rebounds will be massive. If David Gasson has zero points, but has like 13 rebounds, I would consider that a great game for him. Um, yeah, the big guys, the big guys have to step up and grab some boards. Do not give second chances to Houston because they'll, they'll abuse you. And then uh, I'll say for my prediction, I think I put uh, it would. I think it's going to be even closer than you have. Okay. Uh, I think that K State kind of hangs around, but Houston just makes more plays down the stretch, and Houston wins seventy to sixty two, or okay. seventy two sixty four. Actually, is what I wrote. Okay. Yeah. No, I I get that. And look, I I, I want people to know that I think K State is capable of going in and winning that game tomorrow, and I won't be shocked if they do just you know percentage chance wise it, Houston is the better team K-State has the more volatile roster that you really never know what you're going to get from them uh, so it just seems likely that they're not going to be able to get it done but I also feel like K-State's going to be pretty big underdogs I'd imagine when the line comes mm-hmm. out oh yeah like, th- this is a game where like it's not okay to lose and you should never accept losing but like it's not the end of the world this was a week where there's not many times where you're going to play back-to-back road games against very, very good teams that match up with you really well, and you're going to win one of those or both. Like The most likely result was going 0-2 this week. Yeah, we'll see how it ends up going down for the Cats, but this is uh, this is starting to get into a very pivotal point in the schedule for them, and they really give themselves a big boost if they find some way to overcome a dangerous opponent and some struggling players uh, when they go to Houston on Saturday morning. So 11 a.m. tip on ESPN. It's the big crew, John Shabby, Fran Fraschilla in the house for that game. So be sure to uh, take it in. And then we'll be back here after the game on Saturday with the instant reaction. Plenty of other K-State coverage over at kstateonline.com. Just head over to On3, find the K-State tab, and uh, get up to date with everything going on because not only is it basketball on the court, there's a a lot going on behind the scenes with K-State and Iowa State. So read up on that situation uh, if you're still wondering why Jerome Tang was so animated at different points during that game. So that will do it for us. For Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Voth. Thanks for watching K-State Online.